Okay, good morning everyone, and Hazak Baruch, thank you for joining us on this beautiful <clears throat> Monday morning as we are studying a new book, the book of Devarim. Devarim means things, okay? Things. Um, and of course, our book is also known as Mishneh Torah. What does Mishneh Torah mean? It means the second Torah. What does it mean, the second Torah? It really means a repetition of the Torah. And Moshe Rabbeinu, throughout the rest of this book, Devarim, is going to repeat what happened over the last 40 years to the Jewish people, teaching them lessons. Again, this is the generation that's about to enter the land of Israel, and he's not going to go in with them. So he's going to give them his final speech, um, you know, giving them the goods that they need, the lessons that they need, that they can enter the land of Israel with the proper frame of mind. And the Pasuk begins and says, Ele hadevarim. Asher diber Moshe. These are the words that Moshe addressed the Jewish people. El kol Yisrael. These are the words that Moshe addresses the Jewish people. And it says, where are they? Where is this address being given? There's the Gettysburg address. And there's this address. Where is this address being given? Well, the Pasuk says, Be'ever hayarden, on the east of the, on the, Right, other side of the Jordan, the east side of the Jordan, Ba Midbar in the wilderness, Ba Arava in near um, an Arava, Mol Suf near Suf, Ben Paran u Ben Tofel Vilavan Vahatzerot Vedizahav. Wow. Okay, those are a lot of coordinates to tell me a location. A lot more than just the Gettysburg. Gettysburg is Gettysburg. It's one place. The Gettysburg Address. This is the Be'ever Ayer Den Midbar Arava Mol Suf Ben Paran u Ben Tofel Vahatzerot Vedizahav address okay that's a very long city okay of course this is not a city this is giving us many different cities matter of fact our commentaries point out that they looked on the map and this place this place doesn't exist this location it's like saying Jiddiesville okay Jiddiesville anyone know what's Jiddiesville it's like saying uh, this place doesn't exist right this location where is it they don't know where it is they're trying to find it on a map but it's, uh, it's like saying, I want you to meet me, please, on the corner of uh, Park Avenue and York. Park Avenue and York doesn't exist. There's no corner like that, I think. Maybe there is, but I don't think there is, right? So this location that Moshe is giving the address doesn't seem to exist. Okay, well, the next pasuk, Ahad Asar Yom Mehorev. Derech Har Seir Ad Kadesh Barneya, and we're 11 days from Horeb to uh, Kadesh Barneya. And it, uh, it is Vahi Bar Ba'im Shana, it's the 40th year, Be'ashte Asar Chodesh, the 11th month. So we're almost at the end of the year. We're right before the month of Adar, okay? So um, Shevat is the month, and the first day of the month, Tiber Moshe, Moshe speaks. El Bnei Israel kechol asher tziva Hashem oto alehem. So Moshe is going to now speak everything that God instructed him to speak. Now there is a very interest, interesting uh, second question before besides our first question. This is a question of Rav Sarutskin, Rav Zalman Sarutskin, and he says, it says in the beginning the first pasuk, Ele adevarim asher diber Moshe. These are the words that Moshe spoke to the Jewish people. So if that's the case, why does it need to repeat it again in Pasuk 3? These are the words that Moshe spoke, like God commanded him. It sounds like there's two different speeches going on. There's the speech of Pasuk Aleph, and then there's another speech that he gave of Pasuk 3. Pasuk Gima. Okay, this is the question of Rav Zalman. So Rav an amazing question. And my friends, the answer is more remarkable. Take a look at what he says. He says, you know, and I want to intro, intro preface what he says with a very um, a powerful idea. I think I saw it from, uh, I want to say Rav Zwai, but I'm not sure. Maybe Rav Schwab. I don't remember the, the author of the statement that I'm about to share with you. But they say on the following, the Gemara tells us that when Hashem was about to create man, he consulted with the um, angels, if you will. He asked the, the, cre the creation before him, what should I do? Should I create man? Well, Hesed came along, 
Kindness came and said, don't create men. Emet came along and said, don't create men. And all of a sudden, Hashem took Emet, the Gemara says Hashem took uh, truth, and He threw him down to the earth, and He created men anyways. So what exactly uh, is this Gemara telling us? There are, my friends, <clears throat> two types of truth. Something very important that we need to know. And that is that there's truth, unadulterated, pure, straight, the way it is, the Word of God, right? If someone says to you, so how do I look? You tell them the truth. <laughs> you look like a clown. You look ugly. Your nose is big. Your hair, you're bold, right? You tell them the truth. That's the truth. Right? That's one type of truth. And this is the truth that, you know, as an example, Gemara says that there's a machloke between uh, Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel. What do you tell a kala when you're dancing in front of her? Ketzad meragdim lifnei ha kala. What praise should you give a kala when you're dancing? So Bet Shammai says, you have to tell her what it is. If she's tall, praise her that she's tall. If she's wealthy, praise her that she's wealthy. Find something that she has and praise that thing. Betelel comes and says, No. Betelel says, You're allowed to say, Kala na'ava hasuda. You're allowed to say, What a beautiful bride. What a hasuda bride. Even if you don't think so, by the way. You don't think so. But says Betelel, You're allowed. You know why? Because he thinks so. The Khatan that's marrying her definitely thought she's beautiful. So to his eyes, you know, someone comes and they, um, they, bought, they bought a, a, a painting or they bought a, um, a piece of furniture or they got a new car. They come and say, so I got this crazy car and I paid this price. I bought this house and I paid this and this. What do you think? In the back of your mind, we're thinking, right? Oh my God, the guy got saft. Can't believe he paid that much. The house is such a bad location. There's no yard. There's no room. The setup, it's very uh, strange. And in your head, you're thinking the guy got the worst uh, deal in history. Now, this guy doesn't think that. This guy thinks he got a steal. He thinks he got an amazing house, an amazing place, a great car. He got a great purchase. He got an amazing wife. and She got an amazing husband. And so the Gemara says that when a person comes and asks you, what do you think of this thing that I bought? It's not right to tell them what you really think. What you really think isn't the right thing to say. Because you may think it's an ugly thing that you bought. That's not what you should say. What you should say is, wow, what a, what a great car. Psh, how'd, you, how'd you find that deal? It's worth a lot more than that. Right? Why? Now again, I'm talking about a case that it's that the deal is done and he can't back out. If the guy's coming to, for you uh, to you for advice in the middle of a deal and they're asking you, what do you think? Should I should I go ahead with it? Then you could give them an advice, right? But after the fact, it's done. You can't help them. They already bought it. So so um, the the Gemara says, right? You're not supposed to always say the truth. The truth we say in English, the truth hurts. Life. Emet isn't always about saying the way things are. You know, the, the prophets, they used to speak like that. When a Navi used to speak, a Navi came and he spoke to the people the way it is. You guys are sinners and you're going to go and you're going to go to Gehenam and he's going to punish you. He's going to rain down fire and you got to shape up. You ever read the, the words of the prophets? The words of the prophets are very scary. As an example, Yeshayahu came Hoi goy hote. I'm giving you one one pasuk. You sinful nation, am kaved avon, filled with sin, zera menaim, horrible seeds, bani mashhitim, children that are corrupt. Okay, so that's not a nice, not not an easy statement to swallow. But the neviim used to speak the truth. Of course, as messengers of God, they were obligated to speak the truth. They were entitled. They were supposed to. Uh, as an example, we, we say in the Haftarah, whenever we read the Haftarah as an example on Shabbat or the holidays, there's a bracha that we say, and the bracha says, Asher ratzah b'tvarehem ha'ne'emarim be'emet. 
that God chooses the words of the prophets who speak in truth. What that means is that the prophets, the way they spoke, is that when they would come to a person and a person would say, so Rabbi, what do you think of me? The Navi would say, what do I think of you? I think you're a sinner. I think you're horrible. You better shape up. You got to improve. You're not learning. You're not doing enough chesed. You're a horrible, right? He'll tell you the truth, how it is. Now again, it's very hard to hear, right? It's not easy to hear the truth sometimes. A person says to you, how do I look? You want, you want to hear, you look good. You know, I ask people all the time, you know, when, especially when I started off as a speaker. So, how was it? How did I speak? I was very uh, self-conscious. So I would ask my wife, who would always come to hear me, so, Frida, what do you think? Was it, was it good? And, uh, you know, she was, she, was, she was good about it. You know, she'd say, yeah, it was, it was very good. Don't worry. <laughs> and I could tell a little bit from her tone, maybe it wasn't the best, you know what I mean? But um, we don't like to hear the truth. We want to hear how we are amazing, how we're great, how we're doing the best. There's no one better than us. But the prophet, they didn't speak like that. Uh, when Shemuel rebuked Shaul, God gave Shmuel a prophecy to go and tell Shaul that he's going to get removed. He's going to get displaced as king. Shmuel said it how it is. Nathan came to, God, to, to David HaMelech and he said it how it is. Yirmiyahu, Chizkiyahu, all the prophets, they say the message the way it's meant to be said. But that is only heaven, matters from the heaven. Matters from the heavens, things from Shamayim, messages from God, messengers from God, that's how they speak. They're, they are supposed to say, you're doing wrong. Problem is down here in this world, can't talk like that. Can't talk like that. Says Betilil, you don't tell a, a guy, you know, your wife, she's got this issue, she's got that issue. You say, Kala na'ava chasuda. She's a beautiful bride. Wow, what a great girl. Such good character. Because he thinks so. And he's already walked down the aisle with her. And nothing's going to change anymore. They're already married. And so, compliments, praise. Is it lying? Is it lying? The Torah says, you know, that's a lie. So the answer is, it's very interesting. The Torah doesn't say, say the truth. You ever notice that? Torah doesn't say to dabir emit. Torah says, stay away from a lie. The truth, the Torah doesn't command us to say the truth because the Torah knows that sometimes you shouldn't say the truth. If, you if your friend says, so what do you think of this purchase? The truth is it's a bad purchase, but you're not supposed to say it's a bad purchase. If the Torah commanded us to say the truth, then that's what I'm supposed to do. But the Torah says actually in the negative, so sometimes, it's okay to not say the truth. You know, if there's a patient in the hospital who's about to go, the doctor's not supposed to tell him that. He's supposed to maybe tell the family, let them arrange what they need. But to the patient, he's supposed to make him feel good. Yeah, you're looking great. You're gonna get out of here. And therefore, this is what the Gemara means, by the way. Truth comes and says, you know, God, they don't deserve to be created. They lie. And Hashem took truth and threw him down to the earth. And you know what he's saying? God's saying, you know what? Maybe they're lying according to our standards of truth. Up here in Shamaim language. But down there on earth language, that's the way you're supposed to speak. You're supposed to a little bit exaggerate. You're supposed to tell the guy what he wants to hear sometimes. That's okay. There's nothing nice about being a little bit untruthful. There's no mitzvah to always say the truth. When someone's going to die and you're going to inherit them. Oh, I hope you die soon. I can't wait to take the uh, inheritance. <laughs> what are you doing? It's not a way to talk. And therefore, today, by the way, today, the Gemara says that uh, ever since prophecy ended, the Gemara says, you ready for this? The Gemara says, if you ever want to find prophecy, you could go to two places. Fools and little children. That's what the Gemara says. It means, if you want to find prophecy, Nevi'im died, their power was given to fools and little children. What does that mean? That little kids are prophets. What it means is that the function of a prophet, which was a prophet's job, was to hit you on the head and tell you the straight truth. 
that power, once the Navi, once the Prophet era ended, that ability to speak the truth, the pure truth, you don't find it today. Today people don't speak the truth. We don't want to hurt feelings. We don't say the truth always. Someone says to you, how do you like my house? Beautiful house. Wow. It's not the truth. But you want to know the truth today? Gemara says go to two places. Go to kids, little children, and you could go to foolish people, people that are not mentally well. Those people, they say the truth. You ever saw little kids? Little kids, they know how to tell you. Little kids, sometimes they speak too much. Hey, shut up. Quiet. Go to other room. Go play. Right? Why? Because they're saying the truth. Little kids, they don't know how to lie. And also, fools, they don't know how to lie. They say, they, th they say things how it is. They say what comes to their mind. They don't have a filter. So, Moshe Rabbeinu, let's come back to our parasha for a minute. Moshe Rabbeinu, he is right here on the, he's on his deathbed, so to speak. He's about to go on to the next world. And he's, he's got to rebuke the Jewish people. And Moshe realizes there's two ways to rebuke them. There's the right way and the wrong way. And, I'll tell, and I'm going to tell you both, and you tell me which one's the right way, which one's the wrong way. One way is the way prophets are supposed to rebuke. How does a prophet rebuke? He says it straight. What you're doing wrong. That's one way to rebuke them. The other way is by doing it in a very casual manner. In a very positive, with a positive spin. Now the Gemara tells us in Masech Ketubot, pay attention to this. Gemara tells us, page 105, look what the Gemara says. Gemara says, I'll read to you the language first. Says the Gemara, Hai tsurba mirabbanan. Okay, if you have a rabbi, demrahamin le bene mata, that is loved by the people, lav mishum dema'alet fe, it's not because of his great uh, personality, Rather, it's because he's not rebuking them in matters of the heavens. So on a simple level, at face value, the Gemara is telling us that if there's a rabbi that's loved by everyone, it's not necessarily a good thing. Yesterday, I was playing basketball. I was exercising a little bit. And a guy came to me. He's like, Rabbi, I got I to give you a compliment. I said, okay, let me hear. He said, I was talking to this one guy. And this guy said, you know... I don't like rabbis. I hate listening to them. I'm not a rabbi guy. Except for this one rabbi. This one rabbi. I love this guy. Ariel Mizrahi. <laughs> so I was very flattered. I must admit. But then again, I was reminded of this Gemara. That if, uh, if a guy is, is loved by the people, maybe you're not doing the right job. I started wondering, maybe if, if this guy likes me and he hates rabbis, but he likes me, what does that say about me, right? Maybe I'm not a rabbi, I don't know. But, um, but right, so sometimes if a guy is only loved and there's no one that hates you, maybe it's something that you're doing wrong. Maybe it's because you're not doing your job. How could it be that everyone likes you? How could it be that everyone is your best friend? Maybe it means that you've never really told people the wrong thing. Maybe it means that you never uh, told the kahal. As a rabbi, you never said to them, uh, the, you know, if your kids love you, maybe it means you're doing the wrong thing as a parent. How could it be? Your kids are never upset at you? You never told your kids something that, that got them annoyed? Your kid wanted to stay up and you just said, sure. Your kid wants to eat junk, you said, no problem. They want to go sleep by their friend's house and uh, not the right age or the right person. And you said, okay, go for it. If your kids love you, if, if every single time, whatever they want, they get... Maybe, the Gemara says, it's because you're not rebuking them properly. So that's a simple way of understanding what the Gemara means. And that's how, honestly, I'll tell you the truth, that's how I understood it until recently. And then I saw what Rav, Zer Rav Sarutkin says over here. He says, you know what maybe the Gemara means? Maybe the Gemara means something very, very different. He says, you know, like we said till now, there are two ways to rebuke. There's the strict way, the straight way, saying it how it is, the way that hurts, the way of the prophets, the way of the heavens. And then there's the other way that's a little bit more subtle, a little bit more positive, like we said. He says, when a person rebukes the first way, 
first way, fire and brimstone and saying it how it is, which is the way they used to do it, the prophets. But you know what? That hurts people's feelings. That makes a lot of scars. That leaves a lot of marks. It's not a clean way of rebuking. And like we said, it's not even the right way to do it today. It's, by the way, to be frank, it's also dangerous. You tell a guy, that, you know, how it is, he may punch you in the face. By the way, Yeshaya Hanavi was killed by the king. Yeshaya was killed by the king. So even though maybe as a prophet, that was his job to say it how it is, but it's going to create a lot of enemies. So now he says, now we understand what the Gemara means. The Gemara says that if there's a rabbi that is loved by everyone, you know why? Not because he doesn't give rebuke at all. But it's because he's not giving rebuke the way bemili dishmaya. You know what that means? He's not rebuking the way heaven would rebuke. And that's a good thing, by the way. If you're loved by everyone, it means you're rebuking the right way. It's not telling you uh, if you're loved by everyone, then you're doing something wrong. No, no, no. Opposite, according to this. It's saying that if you're loved by everyone, it's because you're rebuking them the right way. You're rebuking them by telling them through a positive way. You're telling them through making them uh, see their power, their, their importance, showing them what they're capable of. If you're rebuking them, bemili deshmaya, meaning if you're rebuking them the way prophets rebuke, the way heaven rebukes, then that's going to create you enemies. And so the Gemara over here is actually giving us a very powerful piece of advice in general when it comes to tochacha, which we all give. We all, we, all, we all are constantly, my friends, giving rebuke. Maybe just two hours that we were awake today, we've rebuked 20 times between our children and our spouse and maybe someone in shul or you were trying to take a parking spot and a guy cut you off. Whatever it was, right? And I'm talking about myself on that one. But uh, whatever it was, there's, there's throughout our day, we're rebuking constantly. The Gemara tells us that if you want to be loved by people, make sure that you rebuke, but not the way heaven rebukes. The way Shemaya, the way heavens, the way the skies, the way the prophets rebuked, that's not for 2022. That's not for us. Today, it's got to be, again, kind, loving, and I'm sure you know there are different maybe speakers or types of rabbis that are out there. And some, when they get up there, they speak and they say certain things, Mechalel Shabbat and not kosher and this and that. And they hit you on the head and they scream and they yell. And for some people that works. And there's a very different type of speaker. You know, the speakers that, uh, that never yell and they never mention the word hell and they never mention punishment. And that's also a beautiful way of inspiring people. There are two ways to inspire people. And I think for today's generation, for sure, for today's generation, if I may say so, we need the second way. Very few people get inspired when they're told that they're garbage, that they're zero, that you're a rasha, Hashem's going to punish you. That's not the way to talk to, 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 uh, to adults. That's not, definitely not the way to talk to children today. Children today should not be told if you don't do this, Hashem's going to be angry. Today it's got to be the other way. If you do the other thing, you know how, how proud you're going to make Hashem. You know how happy. That's the way we got to rebuke. Instead of telling a kid the nine things that he did wrong, point out the one thing that he did right. And again, it's hard. It's hard, I'll admit. It's very hard to do this. It's much easier to scream and yell and to say, look, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. Even by the way, when they do nine things right, we've managed to find the one thing they did wrong. So, so we have to be able to slowly shift our attitude, our critiques to more positive type, to more uh, compliments, to praising. You know what I mean? That you're going you're gonna to try to... This is Dale Carnegie 101, by the way, what I'm telling you. You're going you're gonna to go and tell any all the stories that he brings. Guy wanted to get his employees to start wearing their hats, you're going to go out and tell them if you don't wear it, there's going to be a fine. There's going to be a penalty. We're going to dock you. We're going to take away from your paycheck. You're not going to get people to listen. The right way today is by inspiring, by explaining why is it important to wear a helmet? Why is it important to our kids that they should wear tzitzit? Why is it important that they should say Shema? 
Why do I want them to say a bracha? Why do I want them to, uh, to you know, dress a certain way? Why do I want them to keep Shabbat when all their friends are not? So to explain in a positive way, in a complimenting way, more than in a um, demanding and a critical way, again, it's much harder. It's much harder. If we're, all, if we're honest, it's much more difficult. But that's the right way today. Today, we can't afford to be like the prophets. By the prophets, the way they spoke, the truth that they gave to the community, to the people, to their children, whatever it was, that's not the way we talk today. That was very, very hard. That's not an easy pill to swallow. And again, it's not the right way. Even then, they got killed. So maybe they were supposed to, but definitely not today. With all of this, my friends, we come back to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe wanted to rebuke the people. He's on his deathbed, like we said. He's about to go, and he's got he's to tell them, you know, listen guys, I'm not here forever, and I want you to shape up. I want you guys to learn the lessons that we made from the mistakes that we made over the last 40 years. And Moshe Rabbeinu knows that the better way is maybe by giving it in a softer tone. And you know what Moshe does? Take a look at the first pasuk. You know, Moshe is about to speak words of rebuke to the Jewish people. Dibur, Dibur is not just words, it's not just an address. Dibur is also specific to a harsh type of address. Dibur is tough. Divret ochachot, Rashi says. These are words of criticism. Now, Moshe in the past has rebuked the people. You remember when Moshe rebuked the people? Anyone remember when? Moshe rebuked the people right when he hit the rock. It wasn't long ago, by the way. He was four, he was, it was the 40th year of the desert. Right when, when Aharon died, just a couple of months, a few months ago. Right? Aharon died in Av. And now we're uh, six months later. Okay, that's what it is, six months later. And Moshe Rabbeinu, at the time, he said to the people, Shil'u naham morim. Listen, you rebels. And he starts telling them, you have doubt in God? 40 years of miracles is enough for you? You want more? And he calls them rebels. And what happened as a result? Moshe Rabbeinu got punished. He lost his ticket into Eretz Israel. And so Moshe learned the hard way that the way to rebuke, the way to improve, the way to inspire, the way to help people is not calling them straight to their face, you liar, or you, you, you thief, or you crook, or you charlatan, or you're such a conniving, or you're so rude, you're so disrespectful, you're such a liar, you backstab, right? That's not the way to do it. Moshe did it once, he called them to their face, you morim, you rebels. But labeling people, Moshe realized doesn't help. Moshe on that day decided, Route one, the, the road of rebuking straight, is no good. Even though it's the truth, that's not the right, that's not the right approach. So therefore, Moshe now, as he's about to rebuke them, he learns his lesson. And he goes down road number two. You know what's road number two? Moshe tells the people, listen, I got to rebuke you, but I know if I say it straight, if I tell you to your face that you're idol worshippers, you did the egel, and you don't have emunah, you, you, you believe the spies, and you're always questioning, you ask for water, thought, I know if I say it like that, it, it's gonna backfire. It already backfired. I'm not, I'm not going into Israel because of it. So Moshe commits on Pasuk 1 to say the truth, but a little bit diluted, a little bit with, with a sweetener. You know, you, you drink coffee, coffee's very bitter. Sometimes you need a medicine. So to take the medicine, as adults, you could take it, right? But you give the same medicine, the amoxicillin or whatever, to the kid. Everybody, he doesn't want it. So what does the doctor do, the pharmacist? He adds some strawberry flavor. So now he takes the medicine, but it tastes good. In life, my friends, we have to learn how to give the medicine, but with a good flavor. That's the name of the game. Whatever you want to give, it's fine. You want to give medicine? You want to give rebuke? You want to give advice? You want to put someone on the right path? You want to tell them uh, what you think? It's okay. You're allowed. You're entitled. 
but you got to do it with strawberry flavor. It's the only way people are going to swallow it. And so Moshe over here, he goes out and he starts rebuking the people, but he doesn't rebuke them straight. Take a look. These are the words that Moshe speaks to the Jewish people on the uh, east side of the Jordan. And we asked, if you look at this, um, at these coordinations, these coordinates, they don't exist. It's like saying, like we said, Park Avenue and uh, York Avenue. That, that, that corner, that cross section doesn't exist. They don't meet, Park and York. So what is, what is the Pasuk telling us? That Moshe said these words at this location. And Rashi says, Moshe is not telling them the location. Moshe is here hinting, alluding to all the places that they angered God over the last 40 years. But Moshe didn't want to hurt their feelings. He didn't want to say straight to their face, you wicked person. So Moshe over here is giving them the medicine in a, in a yummy way, with strawberry flavor. He's telling them what they need to hear, but he's telling it to them in a way that they'll be easy, uh, it'll be easy for them to, to hear it. So instead of saying to them, you guys, you did the Egel, he hints to the Egel. He doesn't say Egel. He hints to it by saying, um, you know, we were once upon a time, Ben Paran, Ben Tofel. And on the people there on their own, when they heard those words, they, they said to themselves, ay, ay, ay. Remember we did the Egel. <coughs> that was no good. Ay, ay, ay. Remember the spies? Remember Dizahav? Remember the gold of the Egel? Remember the spies that we sent from this place? And when Moshe went on, hinting, hinting. It was a very, you know, I remember when I was a, uh, when I was a kid, I saw this movie. It's called The Sound of Music. Anyone here? A fan? Anyone ever saw it? The Sound of Music? Julie Andrews? Anyways, okay. So um, she, so she's this new nanny. She comes into this house, and they didn't treat her well on the first day. They put a frog in the in, in her pocket, and uh, whatever it was exactly. So at dinner time, at dinner time, uh, she she made believe that they were very welcoming. I don't remember the details to be honest, but she she just said, yeah, they were very nice. This, that, and the other, and. By, by, you know, and they gave me such a nice present. And that itself was enough to get the kids to feel bad about what they did to her. So she didn't say, oh, they put a frog. Shame on your kids. How could they do that to me? I'm coming to be their nanny, right? Instead, she just told them, yeah, they gave me a present. And the kids on their own, they felt bad. They realized, oh, the present we gave her. But she didn't say it to their face, you know, like, oh yeah, you gave me a, a frog in my pocket. So she said it in a nice way. So over here, over here again, I know you don't need an example from Sound of Music. I'm sorry to bring, you know, to take you back 50 years ago. But uh, either way, this is what Moshe Rabbeinu is telling the Jewish people. He's telling them right now on the edge of, of going into Israel, all of the places that they sinned. So when he says, um, it's not telling you the location of where they are now. It's not telling you the location of the address. It's telling you where uh, the address of where they priorly sinned. That's what it's telling you. Okay? So now, uh, by the way, this Midrash gives a beautiful mashal. It says his son was walking with his father. They saw a shiny thing on the road, and the son saw something shiny. He didn't know it was a piece of coal. So he grabs it. All of a sudden, his hands get he drops a piece of coal and the kid learned shiny things you stay away from well they continue walking and sometime later they see a big beautiful diamond but the kid says oh shiny very bad so as they're walking by the father sees that his son is, is nervous to touch the piece of diamond so the father says don't worry son this is a good piece of diamond this shiny thing you could take so now this is this is the midrash what does that mean for us Moshe Rabbeinu already got burned by rebuking the people straight to their face. He did it when, when they hit the rock and he called them Morim, rebels, and he got punished for that. And so now Moshe commits that you never rebuke someone straight up. You have to do it in a more hinting way. You know what the problem with all of this is? And by the way, if you go through Rashi on Pasuk 1, you'll see how every one of these locations that's mentioned is alluding 
to another place that they sinned. Okay? As an example, Bamidbar. What does that mean? It's talking about in Shemot chapter 16, where the people said, if only we died in this desert. And Ba'arava means that they, uh, they did Ba'al Peor. Uh, they, they, they bow down to the Avodah Zarah. That's what Arava means. And Mosuf is when they said, are there no uh, graves in Egypt? We had to come die over here. And Ben Paran Ben Tophil, it's talking about when they doubted God on the man. And when they complained about the man. And Chatserot is talking about Korah. And Zahav is talking about um, uh, the Egil, the gold Egil. Okay, so anyways, all of the places here is Moshe basically rebuking the Jewish people on their mistakes over the last 40 years. Which, by the way, is not so many. If you think about it, 40 years, it's only like six, seven, eight things. How many things are listed over here? It's not bad. To make eight mistakes, whatever it is, in 40 years, it's pretty good. <laughs> Ain't talking about a whole nation. The problem is, you know what the problem is? Well, all of this is my very nice, Rabbi. Moshe, he's hinting it. But the rest of the Pedasha, okay, the rest of the book of the, the rest of Perashat Devarim, it goes on and Moshe is telling the people straight to their face. You guys are sinners and you told me to send spies and I did. The whole Perasha, it's straight up. He's telling them to their face what they did wrong. What happened to your plan? It's like a guy who comes with a plan. He's going to play tennis match. He's going to stick to a plan, Right? Right, Joe? This is talking to myself over here. The plan is, you're going to keep it in the court. Three shots, no mistakes. Make the other guy hit the fourth. And then, all of a sudden, you're trying to bring lobs, and you're trying to hit it to the net, and you're trying to make a drop shot, and you're being all fancy. It's like you had a game plan, and you didn't stick to it. Moshe Rabbeinu here has a game plan. I'm going to come... And I'm going to rebuke the people, but in a very positive, feel-good way. Because I know what happens when you do it straight to their face. So he starts off in the first pasuk, very soft, hinting. And all of a sudden, boom, abort. <laughs> abort. And he goes on the rest of the perasha and he hits him in the head. And he says to them, oh, you did the Egil, and you did the Meraglim, and you did the spies, and you did everything. What happened to the game plan? And the answer is, you know what happened to the game plan? What happened to the game plan is Pasuk number three. Pasuk number three, the Pasuk says, it was in the 40th year, Diber Moshe el Bene Yisrael, kechol asher tziva Hashem oto alehem. All of a sudden we're introduced to another introduction where Moshe now starts speaking to the people, however Hashem told him to speak to them. And you see, says Rav Sarutskin, that what happened was originally Moshe wanted to speak to them in this subtle message way, but then God says, no, 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 no. Now Moshe is not the time for that. You're right, in the past, I told you not to touch uh, shiny things and you're going to get burned. But today, as you're about to pass away, today you need to say it to them straight, with no misunderstandings, with no mistakes. So this is how Rav Sorotskin explains this, um, this double language of, we asked in the beginning, in Pasuk Aleph, it says that Moshe spoke. And then again in Pasuk Gimal, it says that Moshe spoke. The answer he wants to suggest is that what happened was, God came to Moshe and he said, Moshe, now I want you to make sure you say it straight. There can be no room for mistake, no messages, no uh, ambiguity, etc., etc., etc. So it's a beautiful way, by the way, of understanding the Pasuk, of understanding the Perasha, because really it's a great question. You think about it, Moshe starts off by hinting, but then he goes all out on them. Now we understand why. The only reason he goes all out is because God came and specifically in Pasuk 3, says, Moshe, I see what you're trying to do, and usually you're right, usually that's the right approach, but not for you, not today. Today, you gotta just say it straight. They're on their deathbed, they're not gonna be offended, they're gonna take it like men, they're gonna take it how it is, how they should, etc., etc., etc. But for us, Rabotai, my friends, what a powerful lesson I think we learned from today's class how sensitive, how careful we have to be when rebuking people 
when giving people advice, when telling someone uh, not to talk in shul, when trying to inspire our children to go to shul. I'm talking to myself today more than anybody in the entire world. I struggle with this so much when it comes to my children especially. How to say something. How to say it. We want to say it. We should say it. We've got to know how. The, the how is very important. Moshe Rabbeinu even understands. On the 40th year of the desert, the, the 120th year of his life, he's about to pass away. And he learned that in life, if you want to get people to change, it has to only be through positivity. It's got to be through a smile. And I'm sure, I'm sure, if someone, had, if someone would come to you and told you to your face, you're breaking Shabbat, how dare you, etc., right? Would we all of, all of a sudden start keeping Shabbat? No one, no one starts keeping Shabbat from rocks being thrown at them. I'm sure many of us have an amazing journey of how we got to where we are today, right? Think back. What was the, how did it begin? How did it begin? What got you turned on? Right, I'm sure 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because there was somebody who was there for me, who gave me a kind word, who showed me support, right? And it's only through that, that we are able to slowly, slowly come back, to help others come back, to help inspire, to help improve, to give criticism, to give rebuke, whatever is needed, but to make sure that we do it the right way. You know, there is just one beautiful story that I would like to share with you that he brings down over here. And that is that there was once a, um, this, this is brought down in Sipure Hasidim, um, the Tzaddik Rav Yisrael me, me, from Vizhnitz, okay? Rav Yisrael from Vizhnitz. Every evening he would go for a walk for a half hour with the help of his gabai. Go for a fresh air every, half, every evening, half hour. And one day, he said to his, uh, to his gabai, let's go to this so-and-so's house. He's the, uh, the president of this bank. Well, they get to the fellow's house and the gabai was a little bit shocked. That the rabbi is going there. He wasn't so friendly with the manager of the bank, the president of the bank. But anyways, they go in, he knocks on the door. The president sees the rabbi of the town. He says, oh, Rabbi Acham, Tfadal, come in, please have a seat. Get him coffee, get him a drink, a tea, what would you like? And the rabbi says, thank you. And he's sitting there. And finally, the man comes in and he sits next to the rabbi. And he's waiting for the rabbi to speak, to ask, pitch, what does he want? And the rabbi's not saying anything. The rabbi's just sitting there quietly. And finally, the guy is getting nervous. He looks at the rabbi, he says, what, what did the rabbi want? Why is the rabbi here? The rabbi looks at me and says, I, I don't know. I, I myself don't know why he didn't, he didn't tell me. And they're sitting there 5, 10, 15 minutes. Finally, the rabbi gets up. He says, well, anyways, it was great. Thank you so much for having me over. Have a wonderful day. And he walks out. <laughs> well, the president's very confused. The rabbi is very confused. And uh, the president starts chasing the rabbi down the block. Rabbi, wait one second. Where, where are you going? I'm going home. So what do you mean going home? What'd you, what'd you come for? He says, no, 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 nothing, nothing. It's good. Says, what do you mean? Nothing. He says, no, no, it's, it's all good. He follows the rabbi all the way to his house. The rabbi goes into his own house. The, the president follows him. He sits down. He says, rabbi, please, you came all the way to my house to tell me nothing? He says, no, I actually came to do a very big mitzvah. You came to my house to do a very big mitzvah. You didn't do a mitzvah. What, to say a shahakol on a cup of tea? <laughs> you could have done that here. What'd you come to my house for? He says, I'll tell you. The Gemara says, the same way you're supposed to rebuke somebody, there's also a mitzvah to not rebuke if you know they won't listen. So me, I knew that I had something to tell you. And I knew you're not going to listen. And I knew that if I stay in my house, I didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to yes rebuke or no rebuke. So this way I came to your house. I sat in front of you. I bit my tongue for 10 minutes. I didn't say what I wanted to. And now I get a mitzvah. So the mitzvah that I got by coming to your house was not telling you what I wanted to tell you. So now the guy's even more uh, curious. He says, wait, wait, Rabbi, time out. <laughs> what do you want to tell me? He says, I can't tell you. Because if I tell you, then I lose the mitzvah. He says, but Rabbi, maybe if you tell me, then I will change. Maybe I'll do it. He says, no, 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 I know you won't do it, and therefore I don't want to tell you. <laughs> he says, Rabbi, he like, please tell me. Maybe I'll do it. How do you know? He says, I'm telling you, you're not going to do it. There's no way. I'm not telling you. For 10 minutes, the guy's begging, begging, begging. Finally, the Rabbi says, okay, what can I do? I'll tell you. 
There is a lady and she took out a, um, a mortgage from your bank. And unfortunately, she's a widow now. She has to feed all her kids. She has to support her family. She's got to pay the mortgage. She's drowning. She, she's in the red. She can't keep up. And I said, you know what? Maybe I'll come and ask you for, uh, to help this lady. I don't know. You have the mortgage in your bank. And maybe there's something that you could do. And the guy says, Rabbi, I mean, listen. At the end of the day, it's not, it's not my money. I'm just the president. I'm just the manager. At the end of the day, it's the bank's loan. I can't do anything. The rabbi says, exactly. That's why I didn't want to say anything. But you made me say something. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say. <laughs> and he says, Rabbi, uh, it's not that I, I don't want to. I want to. I just can't. He's like, I know. I know you can. And that's why I don't want to say anything. So that's it. Go home. Have a good day. Anyways, the man on the way home, he starts feeling horrible. He starts thinking, listen, she, what could I do? He gets home. He pulls a few strings, he speaks to the banks, he speaks to the lenders, he gave from his own, he got a few people together, and he ended up helping out this lady. But this Rabotai is just a beautiful example of how careful we have to be when rebuking people, to make sure that we do it benahat, that we do it with a smile, that we do it in a positive way, that we do it in a friendly way. Again, that's not the go-to, I know it. The go-to, is that you tell them and we want to hit them on the head, we want to yell and we think that by yelling we're demanding their respect and they're going to listen and now they're going to obey and that's the only way is by yelling and by getting a thing and strict and tough and the truth is that in life, in the long term, in the long, in the long term, we get a lot more uh, results and benefits when it's done when it's done the right way with a smile, encouraging Again, it's difficult. It's difficult, I'll admit, I promise. It's very difficult. But that is the right way. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu reminds us on, on the end of his life, where he tells the Jewish people he wants to, he wants to rebuke them. But he knows the right way is to do it. But is in a hint. In this way, deep down, that's the way to really help people, to help inspire, and to help uh, people move, and to help people change. Okay? Well, anyways, we'll stop over here, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.